The Biochemical Society and Portland Press are pleased to welcome you to this webinar, which is part of our biochemistry focus webinar series. Topics in this series will include different research areas in the molecular biosciences, as well as practical sessions to support career development. Each webinar will give you the opportunity to ask questions via text, and we welcome suggestions for future topics and speakers to feature in our webinar series. My name is Dr. Robbie Baldock. I'm a senior lecturer in biochemistry at Solent University, Southampton, and I will be hosting today's session. The title of today's webinar is Careers in Science Communication, Medical Writing and Engagement, and is part of our dedicated early career research program of webinars focused on career support and guidance. Critically, working in science is not limited to conducting practical lab research. Uh, an important role in science is now to promote public understanding of scientific issues, which has never been more important than now during this global pandemic. Communicating science in a clear and engaging way is important for politicians, business and funders to be able to make informed decisions and help to understand the issues at hand. Today, we've invited three panelists working in this particular field across different roles and different sectors. So today I'm joined by Dr. Amy Eckert, Senior Research Communications Officer at Breast Cancer Now, Dr. Stuart Rolton, Principal Medical Writer at Prime Global, and Dr. Sorrel Bunting, Engagement Manager at the British Pharmacological Society. Each of our speakers will deliver a short presentation of approximately 10 minutes, focused on their current role and their career paths. The session will provide you with the opportunity to gain insight into working in this field, and you will also have the opportunity to ask questions directly to our panel. Specifically, questions will be asked at the end of this session, but please do send in your questions throughout the talks. If you have a question, please type it in the question box shown uh, on, the, on the screen. Please state who your question is for, and we'll try to answer as many as time allows. Our first invited speaker is Dr. Amy Eckert, Senior Research Communications Officer at Breast Cancer Now. Amy is a cancer biologist by training and undertook her PhD at the University of Sussex. During this time, she spoke about biology to anyone who would listen at pubs, schools, comedy nights, science festivals, and museums. She has been a senior research communications officer at Breast Cancer Now for two years, where she helps fundraising and PR teams raise the profile of the charity's research, and also helps Breast Cancer Now funded researchers to promote their own work. She's usually found with a cat on her lap and a cup of tea in her hand. So with that, I'll hand over to Amy. Thank you so much, Robbie. So hello, everybody. I'm Amy. And as Robbie mentioned, I'm a senior research communications officer for Breast Cancer Now. And Probably. so for um, I'm aware we might have an international audience here and the uh, cancer research community in the UK is quite crowded. So just to let you know, uh, Breast Cancer Now is the UK's largest breast cancer charity. And we are an all sort of encompassing, comprehensive charity we provide emotional support information services to help connect people affected by breast cancer but we also fund scientific research to provide hope for the future um, so if any of you watching are worried about breast cancer or know someone who's affected then please feel free to call our expert nurses um, whenever you like, when the helpline is open or email them and they will get back to you. But we offer so much more services than that. But my expertise is in research. So that's what I'll be focusing on today. Uh, so at Breast Cancer Now, we offer short term research grants of three years and PhD studentships. But we also have some amazing long term research programs. So we have the, for example, the Breast Cancer Now Tissue Bank, our research centre based in London which has been open for over 20 years and was the first of its kind in the UK, the first research centre dedicated solely to breast cancer. And the Breast Cancer Now Generation Study, which uh, is an amazing study because cancer is such a long latency disease. So you need long term data to understand who gets cancer and who doesn't. So a little bit about me, um, I, I guess. I had a typical academic pathway. Um, I did um, a bachelor's and a industrial placement year, a master's of research, and then a PhD. Um, so my background is in cancer cell biology. And when I was doing my master's in London, I started coming across 
science communication more and more through different formats from sort of tabletop science demonstration activities through to um, sort of quite edgy and irreverent sort of science comedy nights and the British Science Association. So I started doing some volunteering for the British Science Association when I was in London to sort of cut my teeth. And then as I progressed through my PhD, I thought, OK, maybe the um, the pressure and the short term contracts of academia are maybe not for me. So I sought out more science communication activities and experiences to sort of help me decide what I wanted to do. Um, so I've been really fortunate to be involved in a wide variety of activities, uh, such as science festival events around the country, like Cheltenham Science Festival, the British Science Festival, um, sort of one day events like Pint of, si Pint of Science, Soapbox Science, through to um, producing and hosting science comedy events through Science Show Off. And I was very lucky to um, have a mentor in Steve Cross and his Wellcome Trust funded scheme, the Talent Factory. So that's where I was able to get a lot of um, podcasting, comedy and sort of live performance experience. And on the screen are some people who really, really helped me. And I recommend you go follow them and listen to their work, read their work, because they are the best people. Um, so what exactly is it that I do? Because when I applied for this job, um, I wasn't exactly sure what I would be doing either. Um, so in short, I translate the science that the charity funds into English. Um, so our team is responsible for how the research we fund is communicated, both internally, so to our colleagues, and externally. And so we're making sure that it is easy to understand, accurate, that's very important, and as impactful as possible. So what does that actually mean? So there's a few flavours of work that um, I'm involved in. So one of them is media and PR, and that also comes into two types. So proactive, that's when we have a little bit more control of the situation and we prepare ahead of time for it. So this is papers published by the scientists that we fund and people like me and, and my team, we will read the paper in advance, create a summary and then work with the press team to make a lovely press release that is easy to understand and accurate so that the newspapers can report it clearly and accurately as well. And we will also announce exciting new fellowships to the media as well. Reactive is a bit more short notice, that's when we will be approached for comments by a news organisation or a journalist saying, oh, this study from this university or this country has said X may help Y, is this true? And then we will have to read the paper and then come back to the journalist with a comment about this is really exciting or, you know, this is early stage, so don't get too excited yet, that sort of thing. Fundraising, this is the sort of bread and butter of my, my job. Um, I didn't know anything about fundraising when I joined uh, the organisation, and but now I'm learning a little bit more, which is wonderful. So in terms of a science communication perspective, it is my job to help the fundraising team do a variety of things, such as demonstrate the impact of money that is raised. So often that takes the form of like a shopping list, like, um, you know, 10 pounds can buy this many laboratory slides or flasks or higher levels from a corporate donor um, can say, oh, this money could be used to fund a PhD student. For some of our higher level donors, so this is businesses that we partner with like m and and ASDA and sort of larger philanthropic trusts, then we give them a bit more attention and we um, give them sort of bespoke reports of the projects that they are funding because um, in charity, when you give a large amount of money, sometimes if the charity's business model uh, permits, you can restrict 
your donation to a particular project. So I will write to the donor saying, thank you so much for donating to Professor so-and-so's lab. This is what they've been up to. And I'll be writing that material based on the reports that the researcher has sent me. Um, so that helps to keep our donors engaged and we can write uh, bids, proposals in order to attract new partners. And anytime there's um, a research story or a fax needed to be used for an event, like during Breast Cancer Awareness Month in October, um, events, parties, teas, newsletters, then I will work alongside those members of staff. So I really get to interact with a lot of people, lots of different teams at work, which is wonderful. And, and finally, raising the profile of our research. So um, in the before times, uh, before the pandemic, um, I would speak in person at volunteer um, training events or sort of sports events, um, science fair activities. We take those to, um, you know, our colleagues. I, last year I visited the uh, Sheffield branch of, of Breast Cancer Now and did some science activities with them, or I will do that with our supporters. Um, again, in, in the before times, um, I would assist with the hosting and delivery of um, lab tours for um, our valued supporters at the research centre. And I help to write content for our social media channels to just let everybody know that um, we fund research as well as providing sort of emotional and um, health information support. And that is the end of my talk. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. And I'm looking forward for questions later. Thank you very much, Amy. That was a really nice talk. And it's, it's wonderful to see the sort of great work of the charity. So thank you very much. Oh, Our welcome. second invited speaker is Dr. Stuart Rolton, Principal Medical Writer at Prime Global. Stuart worked in the pharmaceutical industry for three years, uh, during which time he actually cloned the gene that encodes the target uh, the molecular target of Viagra. He then went into academia and worked as a research scientist for 19 years. After that, he became a medical writer and now leads a small team of ex-academics working on anti-cancer anti therapies. They assist with publications for one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world. So with that, I'll hand over to Stuart. Thank you very much. And I'll just confirm when I can see your slides as well. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thanks, Robbie. So thank you, Amy, as well. Amy's always been a tough act to follow, so I'll try to keep you interested through this part of my talk. Um, I'm going to tell you about careers in medical communications. I'm a principal medical writer for Prime Global, who's a medical communications agency. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit of how I got into it and how you, how you can consider a career change if you're interested. So this is my journey. I think Robbie touched on this already, but um, I had a long career as a bench scientist. I was in the lab for more than 20 years. I did uh, a little bit in the States. Um, I worked at Pfizer for three years and we, I was on the Viagra project there. Then I came to Sussex and I did a PhD and a number of postdocs where I worked on cancer, Alzheimer's disease, addiction, and, and I had a varied research career. And this was going okay, but in 20, 2016, I decided to leave academia and see what else the world had to offer. So um, one thing that I thought about when I was making a career change was what do I enjoy the most about my job? And I think what I enjoy the most is getting my teeth into uh, scientific data and making it presentable and accessible to all audiences. So I thought about becoming a medical writer. In 2016, I joined Prime Global as a medical writer. And then a few years later, I became senior and then principal medical writer. In 2019, I opened the Brighton office of this agency. But since 2020, you know, everybody in the company, as well as many other people, have been working from home. So it's just me and this little ginger assistant here working together. So now I'm going to talk to you about what MedComs is. And, and I think when I first came into this career, it was a bit unclear about what it was. I knew a few people who had done it, but, but it was quite a big change for me. So um, I'm going to try to explain to you 
what it what it's all about and what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So the key principle about medical writing is to, and I think Amy said this as well, is that what's very important about um, getting scientific and clinical information to the audience is to be clear and accurate as possible. And what an agency does is take the data that comes from clinical trials and assist the pharma company who makes the product and also the clinicians, the doctors who treat the patients in writing up the data and presenting it to the audience. At the same time, we address issues uh, with publishing. So, so what's increasingly prevalent is our restrictions and guidelines on presenting clinical data properly and um, adhering to regulatory guidelines. And clinical trial data especially is, is subject to high, high levels of regulation now. So the medical writing agency is there to support the clinicians and the pharma company in presenting their data accurately, clearly, and according to regulatory guidelines. So why don't the pharma company do this in-house? And the reason for that is that they spend, first of all, they spend a huge amount of money running the clinical trial and collecting the data. And in the in that the course of that trial, you'll have peaks and troughs of activity. And a big pharma company may not have the agility to move teams around onto specific therapy areas and trial outcomes in, in, a, in a short space of time. Um, and so what an agency can do is uh, have, be small enough and agile enough to jump from one therapy area or trial to, to another and, and specialize in writing up data and making it presentable. At the same time, the clinicians themselves, you know, these are the people that treat the patients and generate the data. They're busy treating patients, so they don't have time to write up papers and make graphs look presentable and um, write up the, uh, the discussions and implications about a particular trial. So what the agency does is assist both parts of this, uh, both parties in this process and uh, provide an efficient way to get the data out into, into a published source. So what does that actually distill down to? Um, so what you probably have already had experience with is taking scientific data and presenting it in the form of a manuscript. So we write lots of papers. Um, we might do, we might review the landscape of a particular therapy area at the time and write reviews. Um, for congresses, we produce a lot of posters. The clinical trial data comes out at a fixed point and we have to present it at con congress very quickly. So we do posters and we do lots of slide presentations. So these will help, the, these are, are given to the uh, doctors to present at congress and we write the, the presentations on their behalf. At the same time, it's very important to have wider reach of the uh, clinical information. So we spend a lot of time writing Q&As, leaflets, pamphlets, uh, making videos, that sort of thing, so that the data is accessible to a wide range of audiences. Within, within the pharma company themselves, we go in early during uh, product development and try to advise them on their strategic um, product development. So what, what that will involve is us generating things called scientific platforms and lexica. So a lexicon really is, is like a textbook on how to describe a particular thing. And we spend a lot of time doing that so that when all of the different members involved in a particular product development write something up, they all do it in the same way so that the language is clear and consistent and that builds confidence in the audience. And so when it comes to clinical implementation of a particular product, actually getting it to the patient, the, the, the community is confident that it does the right thing and that the data is robust. Um, another arm to this business is organizing the meetings. And so, you know, we have at any large conference, there'll be a number of satellite symposia on a particular topic. So we, we can get involved in organizing and inviting people to attend that. Advisory boards are, are about gaining um, opinion from from key people in the field and finding out what they think the next big thing is and where, where the field is going. Uh, workshops that we, we've done a few workshops where we go into the company and train the people who work there on how to present different types of data. 
um, one example was how to how, we went into a company and trained them how to how to talk about gene expression profiling effectively and clearly. Um, so that's essentially what we do. Um, so now about the careers that are available. And um, so, so there are two types of people in um, a medcoms agency, and the the one of them is a medical writer. So a medical writer is basically the scientist in the team, and their job is to read the papers, write up the data, um, present, make the posters and the slides, and also as you get more experience, you advise the company on their strategic planning. You can look at competitive competitor intelligence and also you, you become ex, as you become more experienced you train other people in the company to do the same thing that you can do. On the other side we have the client services people so their job is client facing and so they are mostly on the phone or on Skype uh, or on Teams or whatever it, or Zoom whatever they do these days and talking to the clients face to face and uh, they also um, deal with the finances, the business part of the of the agency output and send send the bills really. And as you get more experienced in this role, you might spend quite a bit of your time pitching for new business. So you go to new clients and tell, tell them all the fantastic things that we can do and uh, get them to sign us up for some for more bit more business. And overlapping with the with the medical writers is that client services are often involved in training other people within the company and uh, managing uh, teams of their own. So you can see that a, a medical writer and a client services person, an account manager we'll call them, um, have contrasting but overlapping skills that are desirable. So for a medical writer, what, what you really need to be thinking about is, am I good at analytical detail? Can I write clearly? Can I write accurately? Do I enjoy it? Do I enjoy reading papers and writing papers? Those are the things that we're looking for. Do, do I have an eye for detail and editorial accuracy? On the other side, if you're going for something in client services, we're looking for people who are have a strong personality, who like uh, talking to people, sometimes like don't mind being challenged. You know, pharma, pharma clients can be a bit tough sometimes, and, and so we're looking for people who are not going to be daunted by that. But at the same time, we need people who are interested in science and, and can understand the outputs that, we're, that the writers are, are producing. Both together, both sides of the arm need to be team players because these are the two arms of these uh, of this business. They're, they're very important in working together because the ultimate output is to deliver what the client wants, to do it quickly, do it on time, and to not spend too much money doing it. So we have to deliver products on time and on budget. So uh, career pathways. So. If you come to uh, a medcoms agency with a master's or a PhD, you would normally come in as an associate medical writer or an, or an account exec, depending on which side you choose. Within a year or two, you should go from AMW, associate medical writer, to medical writer, then senior medical writer. When you get a few years under your belt, you should be able to um, branch out into different areas of scientific services. So that might be that you want to start a team of your own and manage, manage a team of writers, and then you'll go into management. You can also go into strategy. So, so the more experience you get, the more opportunities you get to advise other people where they should be going with their communications. And there's also, if, if you find that medical writing is your thing, you can become very, very good at it and, and become an expert in that field. And people are happy to pay quite handsomely for a really good writer. So, so if you like writing, you can stay with writing if that's what you want. The path for client services is a bit more linear. So you'd come in as an account exec and you can progress up to an account manager, account director, um, and at each level you gain uh, a, a bigger and bigger team and you can manage more and more people and you, you accumulate more and more diverse accounts and handle more and more amounts of money. Either side of these uh, two arms um, allows people with enough experience to go to the, the very high levels of senior management. And so in our company, we have people who've come from the scientific side 
and from the client services side who who have both gone into leadership at the top so either either way up you can get to the top what's important about this industry is that it's very flexible so sometimes we'll have people that have done a couple of years writing and they decide that they want to be an account manager so they'll cross over and and do some client services duties and it sometimes happens the other way as well but i think what's more important is that when you get a few years under you it's quite easy to transition into other areas of healthcare and enterprise so if you've got hands-on experience in handling clinical data you can quite easily get into pharma and work on the industry side and there's lots of job opportunities in healthcare if you have a few years experience in a relevant therapy area um, and of course, you can also go into um, training and education or advertising. There's lots of um, fields that you can go to. And it's important to remember that if you work in medical communications, you experience a lot of different ways of handling clinical information and scientific information. And those are useful for many other careers. So this is about, this is the difference between the academic career path and the commercial career path and the career path in medcoms. So you'll be familiar with the academic way of doing things and that you'll come in as a student, you may do one or two postdocs um, and go for a fellowship. And then if you get your fellowship, you're striving towards getting that faculty position. And as you progress, the, the number of opportunities get fewer and fewer, um, and you're rewarded for having increasing depth of skill in a particular area. So as you, as you progress up to the ultimate goal of becoming professor, you're, you are expected to be very um, expert in one particular area. But a professor of immunology, for example, would hardly ever be asked to give a lecture on Alzheimer's disease or something like that. So that so you become a specialist um, with a deep but narrow skill set. If you go into medcoms, it's the other way around. You'll come in knowing a fair amount about one particular topic from your uh, master's or PhD. But as you go through, you're expected to accumulate knowledge across lots of different therapy areas. So you come in, you may work on one account uh, uh, in cancer research uh, or oncology, but as you progress, you might pick up a neuroscience account or a cardiovascular account. And, and the higher you go, the more different therapy areas and the, and the different skills that you accumulate, they, they grow and grow. So your breadth of skill gets wider, but it doesn't necessarily get any more detailed. And nobody is going to ask a medical writer to be an expert in any particular field other than medical writing. So um, you're, you're expected to get broader and broader experience. So making the difference, making the jump from one side to the other is about evaluating your transferable skills. So if you're interested in getting into medcoms or any other, I think, any other commercial sector, it's about changing your CV into something that shows your transferable skills. So anyone who has written a thesis, written a paper or been to a conference knows how to write things. And so you can turn those things about doing your PhD or your, or your qualifications into the transferable skill of written communication. For, and there's also other examples that if you've worked in a lab, if you've done some research background, you can also say that you've had experience in problem solving, project management. You also collaborate with other people, that's very important. Um, and if you've ever given a presentation at a conference or even at a lab meeting, that's oral communication. And so you should, you know, present that in, the, in a way that people want to see it and, and find and value it. So once your CV is, is reshaped for getting out into the, uh, into the medcoms arena, the next thing to do is to find out where they are and what they do. So get on LinkedIn. Uh, there's a link at the bottom that has, has some career guides for how to get started. I would definitely recommend going on LinkedIn, put some keywords, medical communications, um, pharma, pharmaceutical development, those sort of things in, in the search terms and put them down as key terms on your own profile. And be honest about what you're looking for. So put on your profile that you're looking for opportunities in a particular area, Ch change your um, 
speciality into something that's clinically relevant. So change cancer research into oncology, for example, that's a, you know, it, it produces more hits and people will start coming to you. So have a good look around in social media and uh, find something that looks interesting to you by browsing what they have to say. So finally, I'm just going to talk about the company and say that we are hiring if you want to come to us. Um, we now have several uh, offices in the UK. At the moment, everybody is working at home. Um, in a normal situation, we would have a number of different offices. Um, home working is still an option for any medical writer, I think, and uh, and client services too. It doesn't seem to matter whether you are in an office or at home. It's quite flexible like that. Um, and also to plug that we are one of the fastest growing medcoms agencies in the country, and we've we've been nominated for these awards year upon year. So we're doing pretty well. And especially since uh, the COVID situation, the, the amount of work that's coming our way is getting more and more in healthcare and healthcare communications is becoming very important. So if, if you're still interested and, I'm, and you're still with us, then um, drop us a line. We have opportunities for medical writers or client services at any level. So get in touch. That's it. Thank you, Robbie. I'll hand back to you. Thank you very much, Stuart. Very insightful talk and, and lots of detail there to consider. Um, our third invited speaker is Dr. Sorrel Bunting, Engagement Manager at the British Pharmacological Society. Following her undergraduate degree in biochemistry at P Imperial College London, Sorrel completed her PhD in cell signaling and cancer cell biology at King's College London, graduating in 2016. Since then, Sorrel's career has focused on engaging diverse audiences with science and health through roles in both membership organisations and the charity sector. Her current role at the British Pharmacological Society encompasses managing the society's public engagement portfolio, connecting and communicating the global pharmacology research community, and bringing pharmacology to life for varied audiences around the world. So with that in mind, I'll hand over to Sorrel. Thank you very much. We can see your slides as well. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so hi everyone, I'm Sorrel. Um, I am currently the engagement manager at the British Pharmacological Society. And we are a membership organisation for pharmacologists and those who study medicines around the world. And my role at the society encompasses lots of different types of engagement, from public engagement through to working with our members and also engaging with stakeholders, both within the pharmacology community and outside of it around the world. Um, and so I thought I would start off today by talking a little bit about what engagement is um, and how you can get involved. And so I think it's important to note that there are lots of different types of engagement. Um, and lots of different audiences that you can engage with. But public engagement is one that has a lot of interest and it's also one that is a big part of my role. So I thought that I would start up there. Um, and so I wanted to just kind of give this definition, which is from the National Coordinating Centre for Public Engagement, um, the NCCPE for short. Um, and public engagement essentially describes the multitude of ways in which um, the activity and the outputs of research can be communicated with different public audiences. And the important thing is um, engagement by definition, whether you're talking public engagement or other forms of engagement, is a two way process. So it's a conversation involving interactions and mutual listening that has the goal of generating mutual benefit for those all of those involved. Um, so a lot of my career has been a mix of science communication and engagement. So as well as sharing the kind of exciting and impactful research that coming through and is being, um, the discoveries being made every day, in an engagement role, you're also seeking to create a two-way dialogue between an organisation and an audience or through research, between researchers and an audience. Um, so it's a really exciting place to be. Um, and there are lots of ways that you can work in a public engagement space. You could be doing... So these are some of the projects that I have worked on in the last few years. Um, and it kind of outlines the lots of different ways that you can get involved with engagement. It's not necessarily all events, although there are events involved. So this is the Royal Society Summer Science Exhibition, um, Cheltenham Science Festival, which Amy um, gave a shout out to earlier as well. Um, so you can have events, which a lot of which have now moved online. So doing more webinars and things like that. Also doing written copy, whether that be for websites or for um, different audiences. 
as well as creating networking opportunities and different ways for audiences to come together where they couldn't have done in the past or creating resources, um, whether they be kind of printed ones or hands-on activities that help to bring science um, to life and to spark that conversation, that interaction that allows that two-way dialogue. Um, and this is actually a whack-a-mole um, themed around antibody therapy. So there's always fun ways to bring science to life um, if you can think of them, it is possible to make them happen. Um, so if you're passionate about science and you enjoy sparking that interest in others and having that conversation and getting people involved in the scientific process, then I definitely think that an engagement role could be something to consider. Um, I thought now it would be useful to share a little bit about how I got involved um, in engagement and what my career path has been. Um, so I am a biochemist by training. Um, and I did my undergraduate degree uh, finishing in 2012. And then I just hopped across London um, and did a PhD at King's um, in cancer cell biology. Um, and it was during my PhD that I started to get more involved in doing outreach and engagement um, opportunities um, alongside my studies. So Amy's given a great shout out to um, Pint of Science and other organizations like that. And it's a really nice way of kind of getting an understanding of what's involved in public engagement. And so I also did some um, paid undergraduate teaching support during my PhD. And I realized that the more that I was doing these opportunities to talk to different audiences, the more I was enjoying it. And as I came towards the end of my PhD, I realized that the days I was enjoying the most were the days where I was getting to go out and talk about science and be excited about science with different audiences, as opposed to the days that I was spending in the lab. So as I came towards the end of my PhD, I decided that I would look for roles in the public engagement space um, when I finished. And personally, I didn't find that a difficult decision to make, but what I did find quite difficult was how other people perceived that decision. And I think then, and even still now, there is this perceived stigma around leaving academia. But I have to say, I think it was the best decision that I'd ever made, and I would do it again in a heartbeat. Um, while my PhD experience certainly helped me to discover the pathway into public engagement um, and it gives me a really strong appreciation for the scientific process and that scientific mindset, um, I now use my research understanding and that mindset in a completely different way and I really enjoy it. So I'm very glad that I took that decision. Um, and then in, at the end of 2016, I moved to the research engagement team at the British Heart Foundation. Um, and at the time, that team was just me. I sat within the research communications team, um, but we quickly grew as a team um, and took on projects that um, helped to bring research to life for lots of different audiences. So public audiences, um, helping BHF funded researchers get more involved in the wider activity of the society, of the charity, um, and then also supporting staff and volunteers from across the organization um, to feel excited and connected to the research that they were helping to fund on a day-to-day -day basis. So it was a really exciting role that enjoyed in, involved me working with lots of different audiences. And then in 2019, I moved to my current role with the Pharmacological Society. And one of the things that drew me to this role was the fact that, again, I get to work with lots of different audiences and be excited about science every day. Um, and I get to kind of work on projects that are exciting in different ways with different groups of people. So I work on projects that engage the public audiences, um, policymakers and decision takers, school groups and researchers across academia and industry, everything in between um, on a global scale um, across the society's activity. So it's really exciting. Um, and one of the things that I really value about my role and the roles that I've had in the engagement field is the variety, because very rarely are any two days the same for me. Um, I work on a massive variety of projects that I find really exciting. Um, and I get to work with really diverse teams, either within the society or collaborating with them. Um, and I still get to be excited about science. I still get to be, you know, hearing about research every day. And I get to use the scientific skill sets that I developed during my undergraduate and PhD. But I'm also able to use skill sets that I wasn't making the most of when I was in the lab and those transferable skills that Stuart touched on. And what I really like is I get to be creative as well as factual. So I get to design activities. I get to kind of think about all the types of things that we could do to bring science to life and find ways to spark that conversation and that interaction and make the most of that for the different groups. Um, so it's really exciting. And um, as we've touched on, when there's not a pandemic, I'm quite regularly out, out of the office at events, planning events, trying out activities um, and getting to know the kind of different collaborators that we're working with. So it's a kind of really exciting role that allows me to explore lots of different areas and also kind of get out and about regularly. And then the last kind of bit that I wanted to touch on 
um, is some tips that I found really useful when I was considering transitioning from my PhD into the public engagement and wider engagement space. Um, and the first one is find a career path that matches your attention span. And this is something that was said by a panelist. Um, I wish I could remember who it was and I can't, um, but it was during a nature careers fair, probably in the second year of my PhD. And the panelist said that it's important to find a career path that matches your attention span. And this is really something that sparked the understanding in me that it's not about finding a career that is, there isn't one career that works for everyone. It's not that this is the best career path. It's about finding a career path that works for me and that I'm passionate about. And while some people's attention span might be, you know, 30 years and they're really excited to work on a project for that length of time, I know that I like to work on lots of different things and have that dynamism that it wouldn't be possible to have in certain career paths. So I am really excited that I found something that works with my attention spans and my interests and my passions. Um, so I guess the first point is really just to say, find something that works for you. It doesn't have to work for everyone else. Um, it's about finding the career path that suits you. And then the second point is to join mailing lists. So when I started looking at public engagement jobs, I didn't really know that many people that were working in public engagement or engagement more widely in a professional capacity. Um, and so there are a lot of mailing lists out there. The NCCPE, the National Coordinating Centre for Public Engagement, have one. Um, there's a SCICOM mailing list, which is PSCI-COM. Um, and there's lots of different newsletters that are out there. And not only are these great places to find jobs advertised, um, they're also great places to kind of, as you're starting to consider whether it's a career that you'd like to have, to start looking at the um, adverts and look at the skill sets and the experience and the way that people are advertising for jobs, because it really helps you to understand what you need to make yourself attractive for those kinds of positions. Um, and that kind of feeds into number three, which is um, building your experience and not forgetting about those transferable skills. I think Stuart put it really nicely um, earlier that it, there are so many transferable skills that you are likely to be developing throughout your bioscience training. And I've seen a lot of applications for engagement roles that talk about the number of papers that have been published or the techniques that someone knows in the lab. And whilst you know, that is important um, for certain career tracks, I think if you're looking at things like public engagement, it's important to show that you can you know, problem solve or that you have experience with public speaking or that you have project management experience. And those kind of things can be really easily overlooked, especially if you haven't been used to writing a non-academic CV. So whilst you want to build your experience and take those opportunities where they come, it's also, not, it's also important to not forget the skills that you might already have. And it's just how you showcase that in an application. And then um, number four is to reach out to people. Like I said, I didn't know a lot of people who were professionally working in the public engagement space when I was looking at shifting into that um, career path. So I found things like LinkedIn, Twitter, and learning societies. So the Biochemical Society, the Pharmacological Society have different networks and different, um, they will have members in current and former members who have moved into different career paths. And it's okay if you have that, um, if you see someone's career path and you think that's really exciting, I'd love to know kind of how they got there or I have a question about what training they've done. It's okay to reach out to those people and use your networks and build your networks to help you to do that. Obviously be polite as you do it, but it's a really nice opportunity and it might mean that it opens the door for you in the future as well. So I would definitely encourage you to reach out to those whose careers you're interested in. Um, and finally, I would say keep trying. Um, engagement roles and public engagement roles are competitive. There are lots of applicants for each role. So if you're not successful on your first attempt, keep trying. Obviously you can ask for feedback. Um, and if people are able to give that, that can help you to develop your application for future roles. But keep trying because it is really competitive, but it is also a really, really rewarding um, career path. So I would encourage you to explore it if it's of interest. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions and thanks. Thank you very much, Sorrel. And I really appreciate the top tips that you know you can you can provide for other people who are really interested in pursuing these avenues. So that's fantastic. Um, so like uh, I'd like to welcome any questions for each of the panelists. I have some questions already that, that uh, are lined up and, and we'll start, um, start the discussion. But if you still have a question, please type it in the question box as shown in the image on the screen. Perfect. Okay, so let's have a look. My first question is from Naomi, and this is directed uh, for Amy. It says, your work sounds really interesting. What are some ways budding scientists uh, 
can uh, begin to develop a portfolio together to um, get experience to apply for similar jobs? Oh, that's a lovely question. Um, so, for example, during my PhD, my supervisor received some funding from CRUK, even though my personal PhD studentship was MRC funded, because my supervisor got CRUK funding, um, it was a condition of his grants to have like lab tours from uh, CRUK supporters. Um, so if you're lucky, you can sort of learn more about the sort of charity sector that way. Um, I would encourage you to, if you're at a university um, environment, maybe there's a public engagement or science communication um, full-time or part-time employee within your department who can find opportunities for you or help find opportunities for you. Um, and things like, um, you know, sort of local science festivals like the Brighton and Hove Science Festival or sort of community initiatives like Pub HD. I know that's sort of less charity sector focused, but those sorts of things, you don't really need experience, funding or permission to do them. A lot of those schemes are just desperate for volunteers to come and give a talk or do a strawberry DNA extraction. I'm trying to think of something more charity specific. Um, I think doing these sorts of like getting a name for yourself in your sort of university as someone who talks about science led to me being invited by local cancer sort of support groups to come and give talks. Like during my PhD, I spoke at um, the Horsham uh, Big Pink Gift Fair, um, the CRUK Race for Life in Eastbourne, even though I did not receive CRUK support, you know, people are just happy to have a scientist come and, and, and be there. So I, I hope that's helpful. Thank you, Amy. that's brilliant. So my second question is directed towards uh, Stuart. It's from uh, Lauren. She asks, hi Stuart, great talk. Do you miss aspects of academia, such as getting uh, credit when you've published a, or written an article yourself, rather than writing for a client? That's a good question. Yeah, um, I'll tell you what I don't miss about my old job is doing Western blots. I don't really miss that at all. Um, but I, one good thing about um, moving over to this field is that you still get your teeth into the science. So, so I don't miss doing science because I'm still doing it. Um, in terms of credit, I work for a very supportive company and they give me um, positive feedback and support my career development. So you get rewarded in different ways. And it doesn't really matter that I don't have my name at the top of the paper. I don't I don't tend to miss that because you you get positive vibes in different ways with this job. Thank you very much, Stuart. Really nice answer. I have a, a question now for Sorrel uh, from Lauren. Uh, it says, hi Sorrel, really great talk. You said your job has a good bit of variety and this sounds great. What sort of things would you be doing on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, so it kind of differs pre and post pandemic. Um, so at the moment, there is a lot of staying at home and a lot of webinars, um, but kind of, I think it's probably more relevant to talk about what was happening post pandemic because there are a lot of things that are kind of paused or changing. So I think, and it also is, there is a distinction between when I was in charity sector versus when I'm in membership organizations. So because, in my current role, I work with lots of different audiences. I will work with different audiences from day to day or within a day. So I might be planning um, an activity that we want to create and working with a designer to bring that to life in the morning, or then in the afternoon, talking with our members based in industry and looking at how we can recognize drug discoveries that have been made in the pharmaceutical industry and how we can convey that to our different audiences, whether that be researchers or the public. So it depends on the day. And it also depends on the time of year. That's the other thing that's very cyclical because we tend to see a lot more festivals and science festivals in the summer months. So if you come to me in June, I'm very likely to be in Cheltenham. Um, but if you come kind of different times of the year, there will be peaks and troughs with public engagement, membership engagement, policy activity, etc. So it really does vary day to day, but it also varies throughout calendar year as well. Brilliant, thank you. And so one question that sort of uh, cropped up again and again, and this actually goes to everyone on the panel, but I might direct it towards Amy first of all, if that's okay, uh, is to anyone, is it necessary to complete a PhD or a research career to be successful as a communicator? That's a really great 
Great question and a detail that I forgot to include um, in my presentation. Um, absolutely not. Um, a lot of my colleagues do not have uh, PhDs or masters. Um, you just need like a passion, a can-do attitude, and some like relevant sort of volunteering experience, and um, and then you, you'll be able to do it. Um, like as I mentioned in my presentation, I had a slide of people who inspired me. Um, Hannah Ayub is someone who doesn't have a PhD or a research career, and she does absolutely incredible things um, in the communications world, and has done so well at it. She's now freelance. Um, so please do check her out. That's brilliant. And to Stuart, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I do. I, I would say that it's not required. Um, it, there is a movement towards uh, medical writers uh, doing PhDs before they start, but it's not um, 100 percent. We have medical writers who don't have PhDs. Um, in the client services side, I think it's more frequent that you don't have a PhD because you don't need that the scientific background to do that job. I think with either path, it's not necessary, so so don't worry about it. The first step of getting into a medical writing agency is to do a writing test. So they'll send you a paper or and ask you to do to write a short piece, and you'll be assessed on your ability to write. Um, before being interviewed as a medical writer. So, so writing clearly and accurately is more important than your scientific background. Thank you. And uh, Sorrel, uh, in relation to engagement, um, how, how would, would you just say that a PhD is, is necessary or a research career? No, I mean, I would agree with, with what Amy and Stuart said. I think it, it's definitely not a necessity. I have a lot of colleagues who are pursuing careers who don't have PhDs or masters. I don't have a masters either. Um, so it depends on kind of your own. I, I didn't know anything about public engagement during my undergraduate. So I only discovered that world during my PhD, but it definitely wasn't a prerequisite to me finding that world. It was just, that's how I happened to do it. I think the only thing that um, is important for engagement roles, you'll often see people um, having job, ad job adverts that say, um, can demonstrate an understanding of the research landscape or can understand that kind of thing. And you can do that in so many different ways. So it doesn't mean you have to have a PhD, it just means that you can um, have different ways of showing that you have that understanding of how research is carried out, but it definitely isn't a prerequisite to being able to be in engagement. Brilliant, thank you very much. And so I've got a second question actually for the, for the entire panel. Um, the question is uh, from, from Matthew. It says, could you provide one or two pieces of key advice regarding entering your professional careers, uh, which you wish someone had said to you? And I'll, I'll direct that, sorry, again, uh, towards Amy, first of all, if that's okay. Oh, interesting. Okay. Oh, this is really interesting. Okay, what would I have wished I'd known? Um, that you really don't need to be, you know, the most award-winning, grants-winning communicator to get a job in it. Um, I sort of listed some quite sort of flashy-sounding things in my presentation. I have never won a science communication awards. I've never won a grant from a learned society to do a communications project. And I've never even published an academic paper. Um, so you don't have to be as sort of high flying as people make out. I mean, I sort of pretend it until I become it, I guess. Um, and something I learned later is that in um, your cover letters, if you provide sort of like numbers and sort of evidence of things you've done. So like I've spoken at a conference to 200 people or I've partaken in, you know, 10 comedy events in a year, that sort of helps give your potential employer like little nuggets that they can go, oh, that person sounds lovely. Yeah, that's fantastic advice. And I think the idea that um, you know, tailoring CVs is a is a very different um, discipline. I think outside of academia, you know, is a is a is almost an art form in itself. And I think something that we're we're likely to explore in future webinars. So that's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. You do have the skills. Um, just tailor it to the job application. I, I promise you do. Mm. Thank you. And to Stuart, do you have any uh, nuggets of information that would be you'd wish you'd known? I think yeah. I think I, my advice 
to people changing career would be to keep trying and be resilient. I think um, going from something that is quite defined as a career into the unknown is quite daunting. Um, and you have to try a few different things to, to, to get the right fit. And don't worry about going down the wrong path. You can always change your mind. Um, I, I did a few interviews before I got this job. And um, I think my advice would be to go with what feels right as well. If, if, you, um, if you have a good interview, if you get on with the team, that's a good sign. And, and if you have a good relationship at work, then you'll do well. If you enjoy your job, you'll do well. So it's much more important to do something that you like than to do something that you think you should be doing. Fantastic. Thank you, Stuart. And uh, finally to Sorrel. Yeah, um, I think that one of the things that I worried about a lot when I first started applying for jobs was that I didn't have paid experience and I had only had voluntary roles. And I was really concerned that I'd never been paid to do it. So therefore, why would anyone hire me to do it? Um, and that wasn't a problem at all. So you don't have to have paid experience to be able to apply for those roles. It's about showcasing the skill sets that you have, that you've developed through your training, but also through your volunteering roles, all those kind of things. So I wish I'd have known that and it would have made me panic a lot less every time I hit submit on an application. Um, and I think the, it going hand in hand with that is realizing quite how many roles there are out there. It is a really competitive field, but at the same time, there are so many different companies and organizations whether it's across membership organisations, the charity sector, pharmaceutical, um, not pharmaceutical society, pharmaceutical companies who are looking for people to help them engage and carry out science communication. And so although you might think, oh, this role would be sounds great, there are lots and lots of other opportunities out there. And so it's not just about, you know, there's one job and am I going to get this one job? There's so many different avenues that you can explore in different areas. So not to panic as you start kind of looking into it because there are lots of opportunities out there. Thank you, Sorrel. And actually I'd, I'd quite like to pick up on one element that you, you raised there is that perhaps the, the, the actual roles that might be advertised have slightly different terminology for the same, same essentially what is the same job. I mean, are there, are there key, um, key titles to look for if you were searching for these sorts of opportunities? It is very difficult. Um, so engagement means a whole lot of things to a whole lot of people. Um, so in, you can be internal engagement, you can be external engagement, you can be public engagement, you can be public affairs and do engagement around policy work. So there's lots of different titles that you could look for. I think the thing to look out for is the kind of um, mentions of audiences and um, involving people in the kind of conversation are key to elements of the engagement side of things. But equally, when I started in my role at the British Heart Foundation, I was part of the research communications team and I did a lot of stuff that Amy's touched on today. So it also depends on the size of the organisation that you're looking at. It might be that certain organisations have teams that are specifically designed to do those things separately. Um, and a lot of organisations as well. It's, I think engagement is still a field that's growing. So there are certain things like before I joined um, in the charity sector, that role was undertaken by someone who would be under the title of science communications officer. But then because it was then split out. So as more organizations are kind of looking at how things are structured, these roles are kind of becoming engage, research engagement is becoming a more common title. Um, but it could, it's worth looking at um, science communication, research communication and all those kinds of things, because in some cases there will be a lot of overlap. Um, so it's about looking at the job description and seeing which bits you're interested in as well. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So the next question in our oh, next question is for Dr. Stuart Rolton and it says, for commercial industrial medical writing, is there room for creativity? Or do you find there's always some strict guidelines and standard ways to write uh, in terms of creating materials? In terms of writ written communications, there's always room for creativity. They're a good writer. Um, will show the the skill to engage the reader and keep them engaged throughout. So, so you, you are given the opportunity to inject your own talent to produce a good product. On the other side, we do a lot of um, extended reach materials. So we make videos and, and uh, graphical um, products as well. So, so we have a whole creative team in the company that, that it helps us with that. So, so we do quite a lot of um, glossy, um, fancy graphics and things like that. So there's plenty of room for creativity. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, Stuart. And the next question goes to uh, both Amy and Sorrel uh, from Alexis. 
how much of your work is done within a team or are you pioneering your jobs sort of on your own? And I'm happy for either of you to take that first. Perhaps, um, Amy, you'd like to go first. Okay. Um, so an interesting um, aspect of my work is that uh, we're a small team, the research communications team. There's only me, my manager, and my colleague, who is the research communications officer. Um, and all the other teams, the policy team, uh, fundraising team, multimedia team come to us. So it's sort of like we're centralized and then we distribute outwards. So I really do like being able to work with a variety of different teams. But if I'm writing like a sort of a bigger, juicier report for um, a high level donor, then I'm sort of left to my own devices for the afternoon and I get to sort of sit and have quiet time, which I really, really like. Um, but if um, you work for a smaller charity, so Breast Cancer Now is a large charity, um, we have more um, people um, within the company to do roles. So there's multimedia people, there's graphic designers, whereas in a smaller charity, you might be social media officer and multimedia officer and graphic designer all at the same time. Whereas I have the, um, the, sort of the privilege of sourcing out the words, maybe doing some writing, presenting, and then multimedia people make it look all beautiful. <laughs> Brilliant. And Sorrel, uh, is it very much the same same for you or is it uh, a different situation in terms of the sort of working in a team or as an independent person? Yeah, so in my current role it is um, a bit more independent because we are a smaller organisation. There's myself as the engagement manager and then we have an education and engagement officer and we work together closely on things. Um, whereas in my previous role, there was a much larger team of people dedicated to engagement. So as Amy said, it depends on the size of the organization that you're working in. And I think that's also something to consider when you're looking at applying to a role, because if you know that you like independently working, then maybe a large organization where you're working in a larger team might not be for you or vice versa. Um, and I think it depends also on the needs of the organization. And I think similarly to Amy as well, the depending on the projects that I'm working on, I work with the entire organization in different ways. Um, so very rarely am I on my own, um, but it kind of, I drive my own projects as it were, but then I have these interactions with lots of different people. So I'm able to kind of make decisions um, about the projects I'm working on, but I get to do that collaboration with all the different areas of the business. So it's quite exciting, but it isn't maybe the team dynamic that you'd be used to if you were in academia or something like that. Fantastic. And so uh, one question to the entire panel, um, we have a question from Chiara that says, are there opportunities to travel in SciComm's role? And I assume this is um, irrespective of, of current global pandemics, but would you would you traditionally have the opportunities to travel? Uh, and we'll start with Stuart on that one. Yes, um, quite quite a bit. The, um, so one example would be if you go to Congress, if you're writing a presentation for a doctor to give it a big con Congress, the writer is usually invited to the Congress to provide assistance because the data can change, the, the presentation can change right up until the minute they stand on the podium and give the presentation. So you might be asked to travel to that. There's also the symposia and the satellite meetings, the advisory boards, those sorts of things, the workshops, you you tend, you would attend in person. This year we're doing it all over Mural and, and Zoom, so, but normally you would do it in person. So there's opportunity to travel, yes. Thank you very much. And the same question to Sorrel, if that's okay. Yeah, and um, there's definitely opportunities to travel, much more so than I, I thought, especially considering that I have only ever worked at places that have British in their title. Um, so I always thought that if I got to travel, it would be around the UK. And certainly um, pre-pandemic, it was very regular that I was traveling to different areas of the UK and looking at um, how we can do engagement in different areas, working with different teams based around the UK. But I also have done international travel as part of my role. I've been to um, some major international conferences. Um, I went to Germany was the, most, the one I did most recently. Um, so it definitely is part of the role. It's a really fun part of the role as well. Um, and it is there much more so than I was expecting. So yeah, definitely. Brilliant. And uh, across to Amy, if that's okay. Yeah, um, so when um, we could go outside, um, I was very lucky to travel to the um, National Cancer Research Institute um, Symposium or conference 
um, which sort of rotates city every year. So the NCRI is like a collection of charities and research institutes. So it's kind of like a pan cancer uh, conference. Uh, the year I went was in Glasgow and that was absolutely wonderful. That was great. Um, I was very disappointed to not be able to travel this year because that conference, which was postponed, was meant to be in Belfast and Belfast is amazing. Um, my manager has been able to go to the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. So that is in Dallas um, in the United States. So that is a very sort of more glamorous um, destination. Um, because that is an enormous conference dedicated entirely to breast cancer. So it's quite important to have someone on the ground there to report of the to report back on the latest sort of clinical trials and things that are going to make a difference to patients sort of quite imminently. Um, there are charity sector sort of um, internal sort of conferences and networking events in the UK and in London as well. Um, so yeah, hopefully when I have the vaccine, <laughs> I would like to, yeah, get back to traveling and maybe go to a European conference. That would be, that would be lovely. Sounds like an yeah. excellent plan. Thank you very much. So uh, I've just got one more question for you because we've had a, a huge response in the questions, which is fantastic. So many people are sort of engaged with the discussion and want to know more about your roles. Uh, I'll finish off with this sort of uh, final question to each of you. Uh, what is the most rewarding part of your job? And um, we'll start with Stuart. Uh, I think I've already said it. I think the, I really enjoy the job because um, I'm still a scientist and I'm still valued for being a scientist. So, so the products that I work on are, are cutting edge technology. Um, and what is what becomes more important as you get into clinical um, data is that you can see the differences that you'll make that these treatments are making to people's lives. So you see people living longer and you're the first person to see that, you know, you're the first person to see the data. So that's very exciting. I think that's the best part of it. Fantastic. And same question to Sorrel. I think the, the best bit for me is when you see that moment of excitement or understanding in when you're having that kind of conversation with someone and they get excited about the science alongside you and or they ask a question and kind of start to engage on another level with the science. I really enjoy seeing that kind of interaction, especially um, I've been doing a lot of work recently with school groups and seeing people become excited about science for the first time. And I think that's something that I will never stop really enjoying. Brilliant. And uh, to Amy as well. Thank you. Yeah, um, similar to the others in that I like working in a role where I help the world be less terrible, if that makes sense. Um, it feels like I'm helping. I love using my scientific training when I'm reading papers. Um, it is most exciting when the research that is Breast Cancer Now Funded is featured in the media, for example. Um, if your eagle eyed you may have seen a recent story which was funded by us um, by uh, Dr Rachel Natrajan at the um, Institute of Cancer Research in our research centre um, who found a new sort of molecular weakness in triple negative breast cancer cells and um, so that was amazing it's, it's of course disappointing when we produce a press release and then the radio or television channel or newspaper goes oh no actually we don't have time for this which they're perfectly within their rights to do but it's a bit, a bit frustrating um, so yeah, um, it just it just feels like you're making a difference. And pre-pandemic, when I got to interact with breast cancer patients and and see that sort of um, that learning when we're talking about the research to them. So yeah, many many benefits. Thank you very much, and I'd like to thank all of our uh, audience members today who have been so kind in posting all of their questions and making this a really engaging session. Um, with that in mind, uh, I'd like to thank everyone who attended and to thank all of the speakers, Amy, Stuart and Sorrel. And you can continue the conversation online uh, following at BioChemSoc or at uh, PPP, uh, sorry, PP Publishing on Twitter. And for more information about careers, including career profiles and job seeking advice, you can find that on the website at biochemistry.org forward slash education forward slash careers. You can also find some uh, day in the life career profiles on the biochemist uh, webpage. Um, importantly, we always welcome suggestions for future topics and speakers to feature in this biochemistry focused webinar series. 
If you have an idea for a webinar, we would strongly invite you to submit a proposal for an upcoming webinar, and you can find more information about the webinars and propose your own at biochemistry.org forward slash webinars. If you've missed any of the 20 plus webinars that have already been run over the recent months or would like to watch them again, please uh, visit the website or uh, refer to the YouTube channel. And hopefully you'll be able to join us next in the next webinar uh, for the series entitled Structure, Dynamics and Function of the 26S Proteasome, which will be on Thursday, the 25th of February at 2 p.m. Uh, this session chaired by Professor Helen Walden the, from the University of Glasgow. We'll hear from Dr. Yudong Mao, from a uh, tenured associate professor of biological physics and cryo EM at Peking University. And Dr. Mao has pioneered the use, uh, the application of deep learning to improve uh, cryo EM data and the processing pipeline. Um, so that should be a fascinating talk. Finally, uh, in these new and challenging times, it's more important than ever to stay connected. It's an extraordinary time for us all, but it's also an exciting time to join the Biochemical Society as they're looking to expand their online activities. You can join the community of work researchers and specialists to stay connected and take advantage of key benefits, including discounted registration fees for so uh, society courses and meetings, exclusive access to a wide range of grants and bursaries, personal online access to two of the journals and more. So visit the website for more information. And with that, I'll, I'll thank all of our speakers once more uh, and wish you well, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.